Welcome to the Aid Market Podcast, where foreign aid partners connect to learn about key funding trends and market insight. The podcast is co-hosted by Aid Connect Data, the pipeline and market intel software for USAID partnering, and Connected International, the leading USAID partnering support consulting firm. Now, here's your host, Mike Shanley. Welcome, everyone, to the Aid Market Podcast. Very excited today to have Brittany Brown, the Acting Assistant to the Administrator at USAID's Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization, to talk about their work, to talk about OTI's work, the Office of Transition Initiatives, celebrating their 30th anniversary, looking back on successes and lessons learned, and then what we're excited about looking forward. So, Brittany, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join us here today. Um, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Mike. So, Brittany, let's get started. Um, OTI, tell me a little bit about um, the last 30 years. What are some of the key successes, some of the lessons learned um, that you and, and your, your previous colleagues have, have led? All right. Well, I wish that I could take credit for OTI, um, but I was not here at the beginning. Um, I've been here a little over three years, um, but OTI, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we started in 1994, um, and it started as sort of a five-year pilot, actually, that the OTI office was just going to exist for these five years, and then we were going to take the lessons learned from the pilot and apply it to the larger USAID way that we do programming. So if people kind of rewind in their minds to 1994, um, there was a lot of really intense things happening. Happening. And we were asking really hard questions around how do we stop tragedies like we were seeing in Somalia, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, and how do we do targeted interventions at the right moment that can be fast and flexible and short term and use assistance during these like windows of opportunity to build democracy and peace. So a bunch of people came together and said, let's try this thing, this OTI thing. And one of the parts that is so unique about OTI, the Office of Transition Initiatives, is that we have a foreign policy objective. So unlike the rest of USAID or many parts of USAID, it's much more about things like, you know, what are the indicators on poverty, on, you know, women and girls in education, health rates. For us, this is like OTI is about foreign policy objectives. How are we contributing to the objectives of the United States when it comes to our foreign policy and engagement? One of the other things that's really interesting about OTI as opposed to other parts of the agency is that we aren't everywhere. Um, OTI is, um, in, during my three years, OTI has been in as many as 22 countries and as few as 13 countries. So what that means is that we are opening and closing programs all year. Sometimes, I mean, it's around like an average of three programs a year are open or closed. And our programs, we are not long-term development. We are not gonna stay in countries um, you know, for the, you know, decades. Instead, we're going to have three or four year programs. Now, to be honest, some countries we're going to go back to multiple times. You know, we are on, uh, I think, probably our our fourth program in Ukraine. Um, we've had multiple programs in Colombia, in Iraq, in Libya. We have places where we've had multiple engagements. Um, and so it's actually, it, it's a time where we, um, we might come and go, um, but it's meant to take advantage of a moment in time. So when I was thinking about um, coming and talking to you today, I was thinking about what are some of my favorite stories about OTI over the last three years? And I will tell you, it was hard to choose. So I'm going to start and then, Mike, if you decide, I'm just like telling too many, you jump in and we can go to the next topic. But um, no, Brittany's the, stories are great. Keep going. <laughs> OK, so the one that um, I think is really easy for people to kind of grasp what OTI does is about Libya. So, again, if people kind of rewind in their memory to like 2011, optimistic days of the Arab Spring, here we are, State Department, DOD, USAID, we're all working together to think about how we are reducing violent extremism, how we are helping to create a more stable and unified Libya. Everyone is energized. You know, things didn't necessarily go the way I think we had all hoped in Libya. Um, so then you kind of keep going and you look at 2016. So in 2016, um, there's a place in Libya called CERT. And in CERT, CERT was the largest ISIS stronghold um, in the entire world outside of Syria and Iraq. And so what we saw is that the U.S. military um, with Libyan forces were going to go in and they were going to clear CERT. So civilians fled the city. Um, and then with U.S. airstrikes and the forces, they came in and they cleared CERT of ISIS. So huge win on the, you know, the countering ISIS campaign. 
Um, so what OTI did is we came in and as soon as the liberation was done, we went and started talking to all those people who had left. And we started asking the displaced people, what would it take for you to return? Like, what is it, what do you need to return to CERT? And then immediately we started doing the things that they were asking for. So that meant we were just restoring regular services. It meant just government services. It meant sewage and trash collection. It meant running water, access to running water. It meant schools actually had to be functioning. It meant healthcare systems had to be stood up. We had to start cleaning up graffiti and signage that, you know, that was left over from the ISIS occupation um, to make people feel like they actually had a future for themselves and for their kids. And this is the really incredible part when people talk about does foreign assistance work? So we spent $16 million in less than a year, and then 90% of the displaced people returned to CERT. Like, think about that. $16 million and 90% of the people came home. Like, that is huge. And that is because we talk to the people. What do you need to come back? What do you need in order to return to CERT? So it wasn't us sitting in Washington, D.C. deciding what the people of CERT needed or deciding what the people of Libya needed. It was us asking people, what do you actually need to feel like you can have a future in CERT again? So really, really awesome example of sort of how OTI works. The other one that I'm really proud of, I mean, and there's there's so many of these, but another one that I'm really proud of is our work in Colombia. So if people think Colombia, Peace Accord 2016, um, you know, a lot of energy and excitement in the international community, and of course, in Colombia, trying to figure out how we're going to implement this very exciting Peace Accord, right? 60 years of conflict, one of the longest running conflicts in the world. Um, and how are, in the world are they ever going to be able to, you know, tackle the implementation of this Peace Accord? So OTI kicks off a program. And again, what we discover is the best way to implement a peace accord and have it actually stick is if there's community ownership in these things, if there's community ownership in the accord. And again, we got this from the, the actual words of the accord. The accord in include language around how are we going to you know, make this something that people have ownership over. So we designed a thing called the collaborative model. And the collaborative model, model meant that everybody actually has to have buy-in. It means that there's joint collaboration around like joint pitch in. We must all pitch in in order to make the peace accord work. So the way that like this actually happens on the ground is that we go into communities and people say like, we really need some sort of small infrastructure. Maybe it's a road, maybe it's a school, maybe it's fixing a health clinic, whatever it is. The community people say, this is really what we need. And so then what we would require is that everybody is a part of it. That means that the municipal government is gonna maybe figure out how to provide the skilled labor. The community volunteers, they're going to come in and provide unskilled labor. And then what OTI is going to do is we're going to buy material. So we might buy things like cement or rebar or the things so that they can actually do the project. But at no point is the U.S. government or OTI going to come in and just build a road. Like we're going to provide the cement and then other people have to build the road so that they actually have ownership in this, which, of course, no surprise to anybody who does this work. The roads are treated better, they're taken care of, there's maintenance, there's expectations. And next thing you know, we start building a community movement where community leaders and municipalities find that working together actually creates stronger, safer communities. Um, and so it's just helping to build those connections that have frayed after, in Colombia's case, 60 years of conflict. Those relationships that for us probably seem pretty normal, they've just really frayed to the point where, um, you know, they need just an outside person to come in and actually usually Colombians to come in and just remind people the importance of talking. And then you think about like sort of the next phase of the Columbia program. It's now how are private companies, trade guilds, how are they getting involved? So it's not just the tripartite. It's now actually much more this like collaborative model of that we have, you know, anybody who can benefit from this can be involved in all of it. And then once you got the private sector, that's already the transition to long-term development there. Um, well, Brittany, that's a great segue into the next segment I want to talk about is localization, partnering, engaging with local partners. Um, I think it's just implied in your stories that engagement with local stakeholders, local partners, local governments is essential to any type of success in these environments. Um, can you talk a little bit about OTI's work with local partners, their approach to partnering, um, but also any lessons learned for other um, other p parts of USAID, other donors globally um, on how to best implement localization agendas and engage local partners? 
Yeah, and OTI kind of has like a, a little bit of a nuanced way to think about localization. So it's not as easy as, again, like OTI gets funds and we directly hand it to um, a local organization. Instead, we work through big contracting organizations. And so our things are actually, the way that it is local is grants under contracts. And so they're going to go through one of the big um, contractors that are part of our IDIQ holders. It's going to go through that company, and then they are going to actually get the the money into the hands of locals. And um, the other thing that we do is our staff is all local. So we usually have... um, so usually it's two expat OTI staff um, that, you know, that are USAID staff that are, you know, part of the senior management team. Um, we do have a couple of places where we've hired local staff to be, you know, one of those two people. But historically, it's always been two people. And then the rest of the team is all going to be local staff. So recently, when I was traveling in Central America, I mean, our OTI team was 40 El Salvadorians, right? The Guatemala team was 30 Guatemalan staff that are actually you know, the change agents in these countries. So we intentionally are recruiting people who have that kind of change maker mentality when they think about things. Um, And again, like I gave you a a few examples of this, but I think this Guatemala trip I took recently, really it, it stuck home for me, which was I went and met some of the activities we've done over the last three years that we're looking at irregular migration and communities that are experiencing mass levels of irregular migration heading into the United States. So we had started some activities in some rural areas where we had these high populations leaving, um, where we just, again, reminded people to talk to each other. The municipal authorities were sort of bristling and cranky about community leader demands. So we got them in the same room just had an opportunity, a facilitated meeting for them to talk about how like a rising tide lifts all ships. What's good for the community leaders is actually good for the municipal authorities. And then they suddenly discovered that actually, wait a minute, as a municipal authority, I'm even stronger when I have my community leaders right here with me. And hold on, if there's three municipalities and we all get together, we're even stronger when we reach up to the national level or the state level. And so you started to see people actually creating common agendas with their community and with the different, you know, the municipalities to say that we actually all want the same thing. Um, And you heard people say for the first time, they had experienced that we are in this together. This is not something, these are not the enemies, right? Local artisans um, can be working with people who want hiking trails. And you can see people who are cleaning up hot springs actually want to work with the city to figure out how, you know, we stop pollution. It's all these things that are connecting. And the, the amazing part about this, and again, your listeners know this, like we don't have the brilliant ideas. It's actually the people who live in these communities and understand the local context, the local dynamics about what is happening. And it's using systems that already exist in these countries. We don't need to go into places and reinvent things. They have a governing system that has been working for years. There's no reason we need to come in and invent something else. It's just helping people to, to feel their power and see a vision for change and create credibility among these different um, actors. So you talked about how OTI's approach is a bit unique. Are there some lessons learned, though, um, that that could be applied to, again, other um, parts of USAID or other donors globally um, on um, on their approach to localization? Yeah, I mean, I think um, USAID is actually the last few years, you know, talking about localization is nothing new for USAID. But I would say the last couple of years with the administrator powers focus on this, you do feel there is a little bit of a change in the way people are thinking about it. Um, And the change really has to do with the idea of it's not actually just about you know, percentages of how much money is getting into the hands of local organizations. Because sometimes it's more complex than that. Like everything I just described to you isn't getting money into local, um, you know, organizations. It's actually about co-creation. It's about, you know, making sure that like it could just be renting a conference room that creates the space for three municipalities in the local area to get together and meet. Maybe they had never had like a neutral ground where they could get together and talk about things. Now, that's not money into local hands. That's going to like some hotel that we rented the conference room for. So I think it's nice that people are thinking about localization a little bit differently than just about, you know, what are the numbers? Like what percent is going to local organizations? Yes, we're still doing all of that. That is still important. It is important for Congress. It's important for other places. But none of the things that I've listed so far, whether it was Columbia or Libya or other places, 
none of those would count towards localization if we just looked at how much money is going into these organizations. But it is about change agents. It's about finding people in their countries who are already doing these things and thinking about these things. It means technocrats, when we work with governments, who are actually just thinking about how to have better government. And we don't need to be the ones who have the ideas. The ideas can really come from other folks. And this is something you're finding at many of the missions. It's not going to surprise you. Like when I think about if I could snap my fingers at USAID and fix a handful of things, this is hard. Localization is hard under procurement rules and regulations. And we are trying, but it is tough. Like it is very, very tough. Like when we are funding one of these local groups, like we go in and we find, you know, we always talk about like three women under a tree selling tea. And we find that actually these are change agents. And if we talk to them about conflict mitigation principles, they actually, you know, see a thousand people a day as they're selling tea. So we can just do a quick training with these people and then it'll have a ripple effect. Now, these people don't speak English. They probably can't read or write. So they're not going to be applying for a USA grant. And it also means that there's a little risk, right? Like, the, you know, we don't know what they're going to do um, with the information we give them. So there's a little bit of risk. And that means you can't get money directly from USA very easily. This is also a $500 or $1,000 grant. It's really hard for the rest of USA to do grants that are that small. So like smallest grant OTI has ever done, $79. Wow. Think about $79, wow. right? Largest grant. I was waiting six, for some more zeros after that, Brittany. I know. Yeah. $79 grant. The largest is a $6 million grant. And you think about that, like what we can do when we can work with local organizations that are not registered, that maybe don't speak the local language, they sure as heck aren't going to have timesheets and all the things that are required to get USAID funding. Um, so it really is like about the ability for us to be flexible. Um, and then I would say the, the last thing is like when people are thinking about localization, try and have a, a little bit of like, um, you know, manage your expectations. Like, you know, when people talk about like, okay, let's get $30 million into local organizations in X country. Like, let's not set these people up for failure. <laughs> it's pretty darn hard to absorb $30 million, no matter who you are. That would be hard for an NGO in the United States. It'd be hard for an NGO in some place that doesn't have as equal access to things like electricity. Um, so we need to be really thoughtful about our expectations when we were talking about localization. On that, we so we help organizations to partner with USAID. We work with established North American for-profit businesses that can struggle with the with, with the USAID process. So, um, yeah, and I think in localization, what you brought up is interesting. That what is the focus? Is it what's the address on the invoice that's coming to, to USAID? What's the ownership structure, or is it what is the approach that's being brought to the program design and the program implementation? Um, we had. Um, Nobel Peace Prize winner Lima Bowie on here recently as well, talking about localization. And when I talk, spoke with her, she said, that doesn't mean she's Liberian, just giving, finding someone in Monrovia and signing a contract with them. Great. That's local. She said, get outside of Monrovia, get to the other parts of Liberia, like really make sure you understand which local partners you're working with. Um, and so I, I think, I think to your point, it's when you get into the nuance, it can, it can get very, um, um, very complex, but obviously it's a, a essential priority and it's great that the administrators continue to focus on it throughout her um her time at USAID. So moving along then to the to the next piece, let's come to present day here, Brittany. Can you talk about OTI's work, um, the relationship with the National Security Council, how OTI engages with the other parts of the uh of the administration um and, and across the government? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to put on just my USAID hat for a second and talk about sort of yeah, like how we handle the NSC or National Security Council specifically. So one of the things that is unique about right now, and again, maybe there's a handful of people who maybe have been tracking the fact that one um, national security memo number three. So those of us in Washington, D.C., this is a really big thing. This is the thing that the president comes in and usually on day one or day two, he establishes his national security council and who is going to be on it. So it's NSM three is what it is called in our like bureaucratic lingo. And NSM3 this time included a new member, Samantha Power. It included the administrator of USAID. Now, don't get me wrong, historically, USAID has always been invited to meetings that were relevant to things that folks thought had to do with AID. The benefit to USAID being on the actual National Security Council is we are not optional anymore to invite. Like we must actually be invited. So something that people might not realize, like the State Department or DOD or the White House might not realize there's any equities for USAID. So I spent um, a couple, some time over at the, the NSC. I was under um, 
was the director for Africa under um, President Obama and under President Trump over the transition. And one of the areas where this was always fascinating to me is like we would be sitting there and specifically under President Trump, we would sit there and talking about you know, okay, I think because of X, Y, and Z, we're going to need to do visa sanctions, or we're going to need to sanction a country. And everyone be like, yes, absolutely. You know, X or Y is going on. And I'd be like, okay, but hold on, just so you know, you know, we do $300 million of humanitarian assistance in that country. And if we sanction them, they're going to pull all the visas for all the humanitarian workers. Now, those humanitarian workers might be American or they might be any other, you know, ethnicity um, or have, a, you know, the citizenship. But that means we're not going to be able to actually get humanitarian, life-saving humanitarian assistance to those folks because we're doing something in a different track. And like, that's just like a very concrete one for people to think, but that happens at every meeting. People think, oh, this, you know, whatever it is, we're talking about security assistance or we're talking about some sort of diplomatic strategy. And you say, wait, like, hold on, that's actually going to have implications for the, the type of work we're trying to do on the foreign assistance side, what we are really trying to think about. And the lens that State Department and DOD use to look at these big challenges is just so different than ours. Like, we have a very different, more human-focused approach to how we're thinking about these things, you know, the everyday people, the people outside the Capitol, how is this impacting it? One of the other things that's really great about us being on the National Security Council is that we can bring those voices um, to the White House. So we were at a meeting, you know, a couple of weeks ago talking about a country. And we said, you know, actually, we have people on the ground who are seeing the direct opposite, because we have all these incredible partners, whether their address is Washington, D.C. or New York City or, you know, whatever, it doesn't actually matter. We have great partners who are on the ground who are seeing something that you know, is going to be impacted by what we're doing. Um, so it's it's pretty terrific that we now have this role. It means that with that local context you and I were just talking about, we're able to pull it in um, and have that be a part of the policy decisions um, that are being made. Um, and then when it comes to how OTI and like some of the other stuff I'm talking about works with the larger USAID and with State Department and DOD. So historically, OTI has predominantly been in countries where there were USAID missions. So like maybe we do have some like big long-term programming that is pretty fantastic. Like we're doing this stuff with long, you know, trying to change the birth rate, thinking about, you know, eliminating guinea worm or whatever, all the health stuff that people do. <laughs> um, and then there'll be like a moment in time. Something's going to happen. Uh, Russia's going to invade Ukraine a peace accord is signed, any of these kinds of like big moments in time. And the mission will say, uh oh, like we have these long-term development things, but we need someone who can be fast and flexible, get out and talk to the people about how do we take advantage of this moment in time. So this is where OTI comes in. We have a, a handful of examples where OTI has been in places where there is no USAID mission. Um, and that works too. It just means we do it at the State Department. So it means we're talking with our State Department colleagues about this. Because of our like political lens of the way that we think about these things, it means that our relationship with state and the NSC and DOD is really strong. Um, and I, I think like, you know, because we have such an operational tactical way of viewing things, I think DOD would love it if we were in every country they are in. We're not interested in that. But there's like a long, you know, a big pull uh, for us to always be engaged and involved in these things. Yeah, I just, as you're going through that, I just keep thinking of the three Ds development, diplomacy, and defense. And this almost seems like the, uh, uh, I don't know, a great example of, of it working. Um, so thanks for sharing that, Brittany. Um, I want to get a to a couple more things on this show. Um, innovations and challenges. Can you talk a bit about over the last 30 years, again, with the unique approach of OTI, what are some of the innovations either on the programmatic side or on the procurement side and the operational side um, that 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 you have seen or that you're proud of um, that the OTI team has has worked on and, and come up with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll hit the challenges first, which is, I mean, anybody who reads the news knows that when you think about contingency programming, that there's there's no time probably where we've been more needed and wanted all around the world. Um, but we are a small office and we average, you know, around 15 programs happening at any moment. We should not be all over the world. One of the reasons we are great is because we are limited and because we can, you know, be very targeted in the places that we are engaging. Um, and so it is a challenge when you think about, you know, 
uh, aid budgets, foreign assistance budgets continue to shrink, but there's a greater need than ever to have contingency programming like OTI and, you know, like other folks that are doing contingency type activities that are really flexible and don't have some of the limitations that some of our, our colleagues, you know, down the hall at USAID have, um, like bigger USAID programming. Um, but one of the ways that I am so proud of the team, so again, a little nerdy in the, in the procurement world, but one of the things that... Um, that we did in OTI. So we have this IDIQ um, and it's a, in the typical OTI fashion, it has a very clever name, which is SWIFT, which is support, which implements fast transitions. So SWIFT is the name of our IDIQ. This is the sixth iteration of SWIFT. So it's SWIFT six. Um, and what is exciting about this is that um, when it, like historically, when SWIFT had run, it had run for five years. So IDIQs are meant to be five years. And for people who don't know, IDIQ is everybody in the universe applies for this thing. And then they get like pre-cleared um, so that they're going to be our go-to partners for five years. And then those go-to partners, every time we say, we're going to open up a program in X country, those five folks then will, you know, apply for it or whatever. Um, or nine, I think we had nine IDIQ holders last time. So this IDIQ, we were able to convince folks that we needed it for 10 years. So it's not going to be a five-year IDIQ. It's going to be a 10-year IDIQ. And it's going to have on-ramps and off-ramps for, you know, to make sure that we're pulling in small um, owned businesses so that we can make sure that we are getting, you know, the sitting with our, our values around how are we making sure that some of these are going to, to smaller businesses. But the thing that is so exciting about that is we were making decisions around programming based on when the IDIQ was ending. We're like, oh, we really love to start a program in X country, but we can't because we're in the last two months of the IDIQ. And so we, we actually better not do it. Or, oh, you know, I really wish I had another six months in country because like there's an election coming up and this is the moment when we really could do something great, but the IDIQ is ending. And are we gonna do a whole nother big task order to make sure that we can stay in the country for just six months? Probably not, because it's hundreds of hours. So by having a 10-year IDIQ, we actually are going to be able to make really smart programmatic decisions and not be limited by something like this. You know, the IDIQ only goes for another few months. Um, and so this has created just a ton of flexibility for the team. So we are absolutely thrilled that when this next, when we switch from SWIFT 5 to SWIFT 6, we're going to have the space to do things that are based on what's happening on the ground um, and that kind of programming. And, and I think that's, thanks for sharing that story. Cause I think when people hear procurement reform, it's kind of a nerdy nuance of, okay, how the funding flows, but to hear how it actually impacts the programming on the ground, those procurement innovations are a tool to do better, um, to do better work, to do better aid, to do better development. Um, that's kind of transition. Well, think, yeah. You know, please. Mike on that line, I mean, I think, you know, government bureaucrats get a bad rap for not being innovative and creative in these different ways. And like, I, every time I interact with anyone in this building at State Department, anywhere else, there are these brilliant change makers in government that are thinking about how do we do things better. They also are very open to ideas from the outside. So for anybody who's listening who has these smart ideas around procurement and other things, and I think that's, this is one of the things you're great at, like how do we all think together. You know, I say a lot in OTI, you know, none of us are as smart as all of us thinking together. Like what are creative ways that we can actually do things better and differently? And it's okay that they said no to a 10 year IDIQ for 28 years. Like we got it through, right? It was year 29 when the team was able to convince them um, and the stars were aligned. So we were able to make some major change. So, so nobody should give up. And there are these like amazing people within government doing this. That's great. So as we're wrapping up, then looking forward, what are some sounds like um, this is one of them. And again, I, I love the excitement. What are some other initiatives, strategies um, that you're excited about looking forward um, with with OTI? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the things that we've talked about, um, it shows that like the world is ready to think differently about development. You know, we're seeing it on the Hill. We even saw it in some of the language in our appropriation this year. We're seeing it in lots of different ways. People are ready to start thinking differently. I think everyone is a little exhausted. The, the world is in a troubled place. And so, um, you know, I would encourage everybody to try and find that energy so that we can keep touching on things like procurement, but then programming ideas too. Again, like with the world being more connected than ever, those change makers, they exist. 
right? They might only be on WhatsApp in rural Niger, but they're there. And so we just have to find a way to tap into the incredible energy that exists all over the world. And now we can, like, we can tap into it in a way that we couldn't previously. Um, and so it's a really exciting moment actually to be working in development. Great. Then the last thing I like to end with the so what. So a lot of our audience are your colleagues, um, uh, staff at the other donors around the world, but really the NGOs, the contractors, the local consultants that are implementing this work day to day. What's the so what? What do you want to leave them with for them to take back to their to their work um, implementing USAID projects or projects funded by other donors around the world? I mean, I think it's the same of that. We are all in this together. That, uh, you know, whether you're on the contracting side or the policy side or the, you know, bureaucrat side, wherever you are, like we all got into this work for probably the same reasons that we want to leave our campsites better than we found it. We want to try and have a positive impact in the world. Um, and so all of us working together can really do that. And uh, so I'm very excited to work partner with everyone um, who's listening. Let's think of ways that we can all do this work better and differently because the world is different. So we can be different. Um, and I, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Excellent. Well, check out the uh, show notes um, for some more information on USAID's or OTI's 30 years of work. Um, Brittany, thank you sincerely to you and your colleagues for the important work you all do and fund every day. Um, and thank you for say, taking some time to uh, share your work with us today. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to the Aid Market Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and connect with Mike Shanley on LinkedIn to stay updated on the latest USAID funding trends.